I lived in this neighborhood for, uh, for about two years now. And uh, I'm used to the sound of the uh, elevator train and of the streets where old cars sit around in the gutters. And, and in the vacant lot, the, the kids play. Some people might think it, it's colorful, you know? But when you live here, you call it something else. Because the poorness doesn't look good or smell good or feel good. Especially not when you're sick. Not when your body hurt and you want to make it well. It took a while, but we've got a good answer to sickness in this part of New York. It's part of a new idea that's going on in other cities too, you know, all over the country. Here in the Bronx, we call it the Montefiore Neighborhood Health Center, where people from my neighborhood can come to have their sickness treated and their hurt made well. You are entering a new world of health care. It draws upon the same science and uses the same instruments and equipment that health services traditionally do, but yet in its philosophy and its practice, it is different in some startling and significant ways. Here in New York's Montefiore Neighborhood Health Center, and in its counterparts in other American cities and towns, this concept of care has profoundly affected both the health professional and the patient. Senor Gallardo there never had a doctor before. At least not one who knew his name and his medical history. Have you had much swelling in your legs? Yeah, I used to swell up my legs. Well, oh, anyway, the church, before I got to the church, child, I was hurting so bad that I turned around and come back two or three times. Mrs. Skinner's getting on in years, and it never entered her mind that she'd be getting so much interested attention in a place devoted to medical care. Right. So say you don't kill me, and don't, I don't cry. <laughs> you know, it has something to do with your heart. Mrs. Hitchcock complains about a lot of things, but she never thought complaining about her medical care would make a difference. But it is. So I took the pills, but every time I'd take the pills, instead of my arm stop hurting, it would hurt, and then my chest would hurt. Talk about. And just a few short months ago, it certainly never occurred to many of these people that they'd be helping shape the entire way in which their neighborhood's health care was to be offered. But they are, and the medical people are listening. This is the story of a new kind of comprehensive health care, and the way it is being offered in 36 American cities and towns. It is the story of a unique and creative approach to the health needs of its consumers, which goes where they are, listens when they talk, answers when they question, and perhaps most important of all, accepts their advice on how it can best serve their needs. It is the story of a healthcare philosophy which could well apply not just to the poor, but to everyone and affect the whole approach of medicine in the future. Right now, hundreds of thousands of Americans are utilizing it every day through their neighborhood health center. I'm Dr. Roger Egerberg, Dean of the University of Southern California School of Medicine. This film describes new ways of providing health care for the poor, whether they live in the country or the city, by means of neighborhood health centers. In the past, and in many places today, health care for the poor has been inadequate. For instance, hard to obtain, impersonal, fragmented. In that kind of a setting, quality often suffered. And today there are probably 30 million people who are not receiving the kind of care we all deserve. Now, with people in their neighborhoods working together with professionals in the planning and operation of these centers, there are some new ideas and new directions that we should all be aware of. So let's take a closer look at some of the problems and what neighborhood health centers are doing about them. If you're poor, poverty poor, 
and you live in places like these, sickness can be a lifelong blight, a kind of vicious circle described by the physician who said, the sick get poorer and the poor get sicker. If you're poor and sick, there are some mighty discouraging barriers between you and good medical care. Barriers like transportation. Well, I've been standing out here for a half an hour waiting for the bus to come along. Yeah. If you miss one, no telling how long you have to wait. And then you get to the hospital, you gotta wait some more. Well, it's very hard to get to the hospital when you have to get your kids all dressed, to get yourself dressed, and you're very, very sick. Then you have to walk several blocks to get the bus. So I never go until I'm nearly dead before I go or even before I take the kids because it's too difficult. Add long distances, no predictable way to get there or get home later, and only the most serious illness could drag you out. And once you were there, what then? Physicians and other medical people have done a supremely difficult job under immense pressures in the country's emergency rooms and clinics. But as so many physicians know, emergency rooms just weren't designed for that job. Well, emergency rooms were designed to handle acute catastrophes of all kinds. And when the medical or surgical need is of top urgency, they and their highly trained staff function smoothly and efficiently. The team in emergency rooms all over the country function with supreme skill and they're presented with the kind of emergencies for which this place was designed. But the role of the emergency room has changed over the years, and now people bring routine problems here. If you had to take three buses to get here, or a $10 taxi ride, you're very likely to wait until you're really sick, or $10 sick, as they used to say at once. Unfortunately, being $10 sick often meant not getting well very fast, as Dr. Eggerberg knows so well. Underlying all of this is the inescapable fact that there are hardly enough doctors to go around as medicine is now practiced in this country. To add 30 million patients and 15 hours of extra work each week to every doctor's workload, would throw the whole medical system into chaos. The fact is, we need to explore new ways of delivering health care. Health care to everybody, not just the poor. And this means using as many people as we can to extend the hands of the doctors, something that is being tried in the neighborhood health centers. The health problems that plague the city ghettos the migrant camps, the poor wherever they were, concerned physicians and health professionals all over the country. And exploration for creative solutions was top priority. And with the help of the Office of Economic Opportunity, the search became known as the Health Right Programs. And so it began. In the city ghettos and country towns, something was happening. Members of the health professions working closely with the OEO, had begun to implement the idea of community medicine in action. The idea was to deliver high-quality, accessible, comprehensive, one-door care where the whole family's health needs could be met. They called it the Neighborhood Health Center. And the neighborhood was so involved in it that in little towns like Albiso, California, they built it themselves. There's more than just hammer and saw participation here. This is community participation, because this group, voluntarily building its own center, has a unity of strength that can address other problems, too. 
And as they break for lunch, they may well talk about things like housing and education and welfare. Community worker Tom Uridale puts it this way. Through the experience of attacking a specific problem and working with one another, they've begun to see the relationship of such things as health problems to the lack of housing, lack of education, a lack of response by the institutions in the society that so dramatically affect their lives. And not only do they have, at least some of them have, for the first time, a positive image of themselves, but they're beginning to see ways that they can move, possibly, to change some of the other areas of their life. So, with the vigorous and necessary help of community workers like Tom Uridel, the medically deprived people of communities like El Viso were helping themselves. A health center in this neighborhood? That's right. And it wasn't even faintly going to resemble a chilly, impersonal hospital emergency room. This was going to be accessible care. And if they had anything to say about it, it was going to be given in the best-looking building in town. The centers didn't have to be magnificent or even elaborate to begin with. San Francisco's first quarters were in house trailers, drawn up around this attractive courtyard. But they did have to be convenient and comfortable and easy of access, with pleasant waiting rooms in which neighborhood people would feel welcome and at home. Poor people aren't so far outside the mainstream of medical care that they don't want what other people want. Perhaps most significantly, they want what health professionals themselves want. They want private offices. All right. Now you tell me, is this comfortable? Yeah. Has she got any calls? They want quiet examining rooms. They are open at work. They want comfortable conference areas where a warm and lasting relationship can be established between health professionals and patients. Buenas tardes, señora Alvarado. Buenas tardes, doctor. Eh, yo soy el doctor Consiglieri, voy a ser su obstetra con el cuidado prenatal. I find that in this doctor-patient relationship, we are able to uh, establish uh, more than just the ordinary doctor-patient relationship, but rather that of a friendship in which we're not interested only in the pregnancy, but in the whole family. And I feel that centers such as this uh, should not be only interested in providing health care, but also in raising the standard of living and giving hope for future generations to come. You see, a fundamental and most important concept of the health center is to offer patients family care medical service through an approach with tremendous implications for the whole medical field. It's called team medicine, and it's offered by a highly organized group whose members respond to patient needs, both medical and social. The typical health team is made up of physicians, usually an internist and pediatrician, though frequently including an obstetrician too, a dentist, a public health nurse, and one or more new health specialists called family health workers. When a family registers at the center, it is assigned to a health team which will be responsible for all of its health needs. So it's possible for an entire family to come in at once and each member be seen by the appropriate person on their team. In order to protect your... Oh, boy. Wow. Yeah, put your tongue back, honey. Look at that. This boy. And an extra two. Right. And while his father is getting attention just down the hall, young Spanky is getting his pediatric workup. As a member of the team, uh, the pediatrician has the unique opportunity to use his pediatric training to best advantage. He doesn't wind up spending half of his time as a uh, clerk or a record taker or a social worker uh, or as a nurse or receptionist. All of the members of the team contribute uh, as co-equals with their own specialized area uh, of expertise. Uh, in my particular case, I've found over the months that uh, more and more I have learned to rely upon the other members of the team to do their part of the job, and so I've had more time to concentrate on what I can do best to help the entire family and the patient uh, 
in their total medical care. Then let me know and I'll get the social worker to talk to you and maybe give you some help because he's at a pretty rough age right now without a diet and the diet may be a little bit too much for him to handle. I think as far as I can see from this picture, 